sometimes I think we're so afraid of being afraid, so afraid of being depressed. Lord, here where I'm, here's where I'm at, and honestly, I'm struggling right now. But oftentimes, the reaction was, I'm depressed, I'm depressed, I don't want to be depressed. Give me something, give me something, give me something. 20% of self-identifying heterosexual men suffer from depression. So if you suffer from depression, you're one of five, right? While those who self-identify as bisexual or gay, the rate is almost 40% suffering from depression. And among women who claim to be lesbians, the rate is about 40%. And the rate of depression for, those identifying, for women identifying as bisexual it's 45%. Almost half of all women who claim to be bisexual are su suffering from severe depression. Factor in the huge percentage of our population that is in or has spent time in jail. And again, you think communist China, you think African regimes, you think the, you think the Middle East and the old Soviet bloc countries. No other nation has such a high percentage of their people in jail. We've incarcerated a huge percentage of our population. Think about all these things, and two things are obvious. Two things are obvious. Under the veneer of success in the United States, we are a troubled people. I don't think when we look at the pornography, the substance abuse, the medications, the, the, the incarceration rate, we can deny we are a troubled people. And secondly, it's obvious that the things we think will save us, education, material wealth, Pax Americana, American peace, right? We brought peace to the world uh, in an amazing level since World War II. Uh, rising lifespans in liberty, as wonderful as all of that is, those things have not saved us from this underlying sense of unease. Deep inside, we're afraid. Deep inside, there's an incapacitating fear and a paralyzing fear that this could all go away. That there's no stability here. There's nothing I can rely on. That life is out of control. With greater prosperity and comfort and pleasure comes the realization we have more to lose. Right? You're not afraid of losing 100 bucks if all you got is 10 bucks. You got 100 bucks in your pocket, then you worry about losing that. Again, we're a troubled people, and sometimes that includes me. So even though today's message is countercultural and very difficult and convicting, I am really glad that our loving Savior took the time to address these issues about worry in the Scripture. I'm so glad Jesus took the time to address these things. But I've got to tell you, as thankful as I am, again, again, I have to admit, I'm kind of ambivalent. I'm kind of ambivalent about what Christ teaches here. On the one hand, it's comforting, it's beautiful, but on the other hand, extraordinarily convicting and terrifying. God is calling us not only out of this world's value systems, God is calling us out of ourselves. And he's very serious about it. What does that mean for you and I to be saved out of ourselves? Not I heard this week, I think it was J.I. Packer, he was saying that the, he just went blind this, uh, over this Christmas break. So he's no longer going to be preaching or, or writing anymore. He's in his 90s and he says he's ready to go. Uh, he said there's a difference between individualism, which is a curse on, on the West, especially America. He's a Brit. He's criticizing us. Uh, and individuality. As individuals, God saves you. We don't lose our identity. Uh, God created us the way we are, and he loves us. Uh, our identity is precious to him. But this idea of individualism, my way, my rights, I'm going to do things uh, the way I want to, that's totally antith antithetical to the, to the gospel. All right, let's read now from Luke chapter 12. Please open your Bibles to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, we're going to do a little review because it's been a while since we were in Luke. But you're going to notice that last week's message from Hosea, the Old Testament, parallels quite a bit of what we're going to be studying here today. And I'm going to read from Luke chapter 12, verses 8 through 12. Here's Christ is speaking. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me, the Son of Man will also acknowledge 
uh, before the angels of God. But whoever publicly disowns me will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Uh, go back and look at that sermon if you want to hear some thoughts on that. Uh, when, you were, when you are brought before synagogue rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourself or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. And uh, we learned some things right away from this. Uh, one, don't kill those who can kill you, because that's all they can do. Jesus doesn't say, don't worry about those folks. They can't kill you because I'm with you. He says, don't fear them, because all they can do is kill you. Instead, fear God, because he holds eternity in his hands. It's wise to live a life of reverence and fear and awe before holy God. He holds eternity in his hands. Next, God knows you and God cares, and that should make a difference in how we deal with worry, anxiety, and depression, how we face life. God knows you. Think about that. He doesn't know about you. He knows every hair on our head. He knows you, and he cares. We worry about what people will think if we let our religion show. Jesus tells us, don't worry about what they think. Our concern should be what God thinks. Confess our faith publicly. And many of us are afraid to speak in front of people, especially a group that might be critical of us. And Christ says, God will give us the words to say when the time comes. You know, that doesn't mean we're all going to be like Billy Graham. We're, we're not all going to be great orators. We're not going to all be great uh, apologists or philosophers. We're not all going to... But you know what? Go there with faith. Go forward with faith and trust the Lord that using your character, your personality, who you are, he's going to be able to speak through you and be, speak honestly about your relationship with the Lord. And that's all he expects from us. What a wonderful promise. Go share the gospel. Don't be afraid. God will be with you. Amen? All right, look at Luke 12 now, uh, 13 and 15. So as he's given this beautiful message, someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter, arbiter, ar, arbiter between you? I should have read that out loud first. <laughs> then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And I always think, wow, that poor guy, he's being cheated, presumably, and we don't know the whole context, by his brother who's not sharing his inheritance. And Jesus' response was, why are you involving me in this? And then he tells everybody, be careful because of greed. Greed is a, is a, is a soul killer. Greed is going to ruin your relationship between you and holy God. And life is much more than what you possess. And as soon as if our, we, when we got a brain cramp against, it's not fair, a brain cramp against, he's not treating me right, a brain cramp, I should have more, a brain cramp, I deserve more. Our brain is not free to enjoy the Lord. Can't. Because we're so worried and anxious about what we don't have, about what we should have. This is interesting. Jesus is obviously much more concerned about the man's heart than about who gets what. You know what? I kind of want to get my fair share, except when I'm standing before God's judgment seat. Then I'm okay <laughs> with not getting what I deserve. God is much more concerned about our heart, the attitude that we have, than about who gets what. Now, God is just, and I'll tell you what, he's also kind. And we know that those of us who have given up houses and lands and family, who've given up everything from the Lord, we will be compensated in eternity many times more than we've given up here in this world because we live for Christ. But here's what we need to understand. God is alien to fallen human nature. 
God is different than fallen human nature. God thinks differently than we do. God has a different measure. He uses different scales, and the economy of heaven runs on different currency, and God cares more about the man's attitude, his heart, and his heart than the inheritance. Let that break us down. Let that convict us. So we're learning an important lesson. God is telling us, that a lot of our anxiety stems from having the wrong values. We value comfort, we value safety, we value pleasure, health, and possessions, and the attempt to cling to these things pulls us away from God, and He's the very thing that we need most. Luke chapter 12, 16 through 21. And then He told them this parable. Isn't Jesus cool? He tells them to, to, to beware. Life is much more than possessions. He says, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a story. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. Nice story. That's the way we like the story to start. He thought to himself, what shall I do? See, he's anxious. He's worried. I have no place to store my crops. He said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will stir, store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, self? You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Kind of wish the story ended right there. I like that. But God said to him, Oh, you foolish one, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get all that you have prepared for yourself? All that hard work, what does it mean then? This is how it will be with those who store up things for themselves but are not rich toward God. Again, let's not be finding reasons why this doesn't apply to me. <laughs> you ever do that with the Bible? I call it the Holy Spirit dodge, right? God's coming to convict you and you do, oh, lay. And then we say, I was able to avoid being convicted by that scripture. Let me explain this in a way so it doesn't apply to me. You know, <laughs> Let's not do that. Here we are, Lord, convict us. You notice the man was anxious about his surplus. We can be anxious about what we lack. We can also be anxious about what we have. You know, if you don't have any money in the stock market, I don't think the last couple of weeks have bothered you that much. If you do have money in the stock market, boy, that's an anxious ride. Well, it's a, it's a precipitous ride. That's, uh, it's scary. I have no place to store my crops. You know, his sin was not preparing for the future. That's that's, the Bible never says, don't prepare for the future. His sin was where all his hope was, where he put all his treasures, where he got his value from, where he got his hope from. He missed it. The devil is a liar. I don't want anybody in this church to be buying what the devil's selling. And he's going to sell us a myth about what makes for a successful life. The things we think will fulfill us and grant us peace are in fact the things that confuse us and distract us from finding our peace in Christ. The great theologian Augustine noted, the bellies of the poor are safer storehouses than barns. And that kind of, he was talking about this passage. The bellies of the poor are safer storehouses than barns. This fella, if he had thought, you know what, I have all this surplus, I think I'm going to help other folks with it. That would have been a much better place for him to store his wealth. If we want to store up heavenly treasure, he, uh, Augustine also observed that greed wants to divide just as love desires to gather. That's kind of a neat phrase to keep in your heart, isn't it? Greed is going to divide, love is going to bring together. Greed is going to divide, love is going to gather. So true. And greed also separates us not from only from other people, it separates us from God and remember, he is the source of our peace. You see how this all fits together? See how this all fits together? I'm anxious, I'm anxious. And I'm fixated on the things of this world. And that's drawing me farther away from the one who could give me peace. It's like suicide of our heart. Colossians 3.5 tells us, uh, one of the old timers said, the wise Paul tells us, uh, greed is idolatry. 
And this kind of reminds me what we saw back in Hosea, remember? In, in Gomer, it was symbolic for the people of Israel. And Israel was thinking, well, I've got to go after all these things because that's where my life comes from. And God says, I'm going to expose that as empty. I'm going to show the nakedness and the lewdness of that. There's no hope or peace in that. Turn to me, turn to me. Uh, and this is what we see here. There is a hopelessness when we go after only the things of the world and we miss out on a relationship with the Lord. Luke 12, uh, from verse 22. And uh, I'm going to read a good chunk here. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and your body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? That's one of those phrases that Christ has said that stuck with me. Because I can worry. And you know what? It's not, how's that working for you, Dan? <laughs> you know, it's not. By worrying, I can't add a single hour to my life. I can't add an inch to my height. Since you cannot do this very easy thing <laughs> for God, right? Why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes uh, the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And Do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all these things in the world, and your Father in heaven knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and all these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock. You hear the gentle voice of our good shepherd, our gentle shepherd? Don't be afraid, little flock. For your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Isn't that nice? What did we say last week? When we're at our worst our nastiest, when we're most disappointed with ourselves, God is a pursuing God. He's, he loves us. He still desires us when we're most messed up. God sees you and I. He knows how broken we are, how frail we are. And he said, I'm pleased to give you the kingdom. I'm pleased to open up paradise for you. So go ahead, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. There's no rust. For where your treasure is, there your heart is going to be also. And there's wisdom there, right? Where your treasure is, the things we value, the things we pay for, that's where your heart is. Uh, I've had a number of people... Uh, who don't believe in God, or maybe they believe in God, but they don't believe in the God of Scriptures, take this sermon from Christ to prove, they think in their eyes, uh, that the God of the Bible can't be true. Because God calls us to do unreasonable things. They also point out that God asking us to love our enemies is totally unreasonable. Uh, I've had people from other religions, and I've had people who, who are uh, agnostic or atheist tell me, Christ, Christ's teaching is, is uh, totally worthless. In fact, they say this is wicked teaching because if everybody followed what he was doing, uh, we'd all die of hunger. You notice, go back through there and read that. You notice he never says don't work. He says don't worry. <laughs> There's a big difference. He doesn't say don't plan for the future. He doesn't say don't put on clothes. Don't open your drawer. Just lay there and magically. He doesn't say any of that. He says, don't be fixated on these things. Don't worry these things. Don't let these things captivate your heart. That's what the pagans do. And they, and, <clears throat> and they chase after them all their life is to try to get this, get that, get this. And Jesus is saying, you know, God knows you need these things. Don't worry is what he's saying. But... Well, actually, I, I don't even think it's fair. I was going to say, but if you're intentionally trying to find a reason to push God away, you'd take Christ's words and push him. But you know what? That's not even fairness. If this is not a divine book, that's not even fair to it as a simple text. Read the text, and he's telling you, don't worry. That should be obvious to everybody. He doesn't say, don't work. He says, don't worry. Amen? Amen. 
Uh, Cyril of Alexandria, uh, writing about this text, this portion of scripture right here, says, how carefully and with what great skill he, Jesus, brings the lives of the holy apostles to spiritual excellence. And with them, he benefits us too because he desires all humankind to be saved and to choose the wise and more excellent life. For this reason, he makes them abandon unnecessary anxiety and does not allow a careworn and frantic uh, diligence that would make them wish to gather what exceeds their necessities. In these matters, excess adds nothing to our benefit. Do not be anxious, therefore, he says, about your life, what you shall eat, nor about your body, what you should put on. For life is more than food and your body more than clothing. He did not simply say, do not be anxious, but added, about your life. That is, do not give much attention to these things, but devote your earnestness to things of far greater importance. Isn't that beautiful, this old time saint? Do not give much attention to these things, but devote your earnestness to the things of far greater importance. Where's your passion? What, what, where's your daydreams? What, what drives you? Is it to get more, get more of this, get more of that? Try to keep the grim reaper at bay? Or of what, what drives us, what motivates us, is to love God, to share his message, to grow the kingdom, to love other people, to create a community where there's grace and forgiveness and mercy, and it's okay to be broken because the people around you are, are debtors to grace as well, and we love one another, and we're trying to build each other up. What is more important, and where is your passion? I think... A lot of times when we read chapter 12, honestly, and this has been me, I've been guilty of this, we divide it up into unrelated segments. Okay, this segment's about persecution, we read that and then we teach on that. This part is about worry and we read that and we teach on this. This part is about materialism. This part is about taking care of the poor. But you notice the way we saw it today, Christ sees them all as interrelated. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.